Thanks for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm from Graham. President Trump is putting his foot down on immigration reform. Sunday, he gave congressional leaders a list of demands he wants put in place in exchange for protection for the Dreamers, illegal immigrants brought to the United States as children. CBN's Jenna Browder has the story now from Washington. President Trump is doubling down on immigration reform and looking to make a deal. But many of his demands, the Democrats have long said, are off the table. But this is a celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month, right? The president Friday saluting Hispanic Heritage Month at the White House. From our earliest days, Hispanic Americans have enriched our country and helped shape our history praising the contributions of Hispanics. But on Sunday, a different tone, taking a strong stance against those who enter the country illegally. In a letter to congressional leaders, he lists his priorities, many of which Democrats say threaten to derail ongoing negotiations over protecting dreamers. The typical person on DACA came to this country at six years of age, obviously through no will of their own. Last month, Trump announced that he was ending the DACA program, but gave Congress six months to come up with a fix. Now his list of demands includes overhauling the country's green card system, a crackdown on unaccompanied minors entering the country, and building his promised wall along the southern border. The White House says it also wants to boost fees at border crossings, hire 10,000 more immigration enforcement officers, make it easier to deport gang members and unaccompanied children, and a new measure to tighten the reins on sanctuary cities. You know when the president says, make America great again? What his people here make America white again. Just last month, he met with Democrats Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, where he agreed to extend DACA protections in exchange for a package of border security measures. But responding to this new list of demands in a joint statement, Schumer and Pelosi say the president's list fails to, quote, represent any attempt at compromise, adding that the wall was, quote, explicitly ruled out of negotiations. The president's demands could also divide Republicans, many of whom have introduced legislation providing a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. Speaker Ryan's office says House members will review the list and consult with the administration. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Tropical storm Nate made its way across the East Coast, bringing heavy rains and gusty winds. The Category 1 hurricane made landfall in Mississippi, but quickly lost strength and turned into a tropical depression. Unlike hurricanes Harvey and Irma, Nate spared the region of catastrophic damage. Alabama and Georgia received heavy rain, and there was some flooding in Biloxi, Mississippi, but rainwaters receded very early. A Twitter war between the president and retiring Senator Bob Corker erupted over the weekend. It all started last week when Senator Corker said in a New York Times interview, Trump's national security team is what separates the country from chaos. President Trump, who doesn't often allow criticism to go unaddressed, sent out a series of tweets Sunday morning, saying Senator Corker begged him for an endorsement in the upcoming bid for re-election, then decided to retire when President Trump refused. Corker fired back, calling the White House an adult daycare center. Alienating Corker could prove to be problematic. He's the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee and could be a leading voice in determining the future of the Iran nuclear deal. Vice President Mike Pence left the 49ers, left the 49ers and Colts game Sunday about a dozen, after about a dozen players took a knee during the national anthem. The former Indiana governor attended the game to watch Peyton Manning's jersey retirement, but he left the game after some of the San Francisco 49ers took a knee. Pence tweeted, I left today's Colts game because at POTUS and I will not dignify any event that disrespects our soldiers, our flag, or our national anthem. The White House also issued a statement from Pence. He said Americans should rally around the flag. President Trump is holding off on moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The White House insists the decision it does, not does not represent a weakening of support for Israel. President Trump said he plans to make a decision in the near future, but first he wants to work towards an Israeli-Palestinian peace deal. However, U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Freeman says he will continue to push for an embassy move and said the time has come for everyone to realize there is no chance of Israel and Palestine coexisting. 
Foreign countries currently have their embassies in the Israeli commercial capital Tel Aviv since they do not recognize Israel's unilateral claim of control over all of Jerusalem. At a time of rising anti-Semitism, thousands of Christians are in Jerusalem to celebrate the biblical Feast of Tabernacles and to stand with Israel. CBN's Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell is on this story. They came from the ends of the earth for the six-day celebration. It's the invitation of Zechariah the prophet uh, in chapter 14, uh, verse 16 of the book of Zechariah. Uh, he envisions a time when all the nations will come up, celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, worship the Lord here, and we're like forerunners. More than 5,000 Christians from nearly 100 nations came here on opening night to proudly stand with Israel and celebrate the biblical feast of tabernacles. In the end of the day, it's God's faithfulness that is sta has established for almost 40 years now this international gathering of the body of Christ in a unique way that you can't find anywhere else. The International Christian Embassy Jerusalem sponsors the celebration. The organization started in 1980 after 13 countries moved their embassies from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, protesting Israel's declaration of the city as its eternal capital. Israel's victory in the 1967 Six-Day War made that possible by uniting Jerusalem. So this is a special year for the feast. And what's really exciting, it's a jubilee year for Jerusalem. We're marking 50 years since the city of Jerusalem was reunited back under Jewish sovereignty. More than half of those celebrating are first timers. We're part of a 26 strong Cook Island delegation and we're here to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and we're about to be registered as a nation with ICEJ for the first time ever. Early on this year, God asked me to come to represent the nation of Samoa. So I brought a team of 20 people. So we're here happily from the ends of the earth. And we ask why they stand strongly with Israel. It's the biggest proof that God is alive. You have the Jews coming back, you have the land flourishing. Because the Bible says so. Israel has given to many nations. It's been a blessing to a lot of nations all over the world. And it's time to pay back. Jews are the God's chosen nation and I mean, you don't want to go against God, that's all I can say. <laughs> Chris Mitchell, the Pice Arena, Jerusalem. Still ahead, it is camping season and we have some survival tips. Stay tuned to hear one woman's wildlife experiences and what you can do to stay out of danger. Imagine driving on a snowy road and your car breaks down and you are all alone. Or hiking and suddenly you become lost and your cell phone is not working. Would you panic or would you be prepared to survive until help arrives? To bring you some answers, I Wendy Griffith took a wilderness survival course to learn the basics of survival. Welcome to Mountain Shepherd's Wilderness Survival School, located in the beautiful and rugged mountains of Southwest Virginia. Here, Reggie and Dina Bennett train military and regular folks how to survive the worst case scenarios and live to tell about them. The Bennett's focus on seven main survival skills, positive mental attitude, first aid, shelter, firecraft, signaling, water, and food. Most people think that finding food and water are their top priorities in a survival situation, but actually it's building a safe and secure shelter like the one behind me that should be your first order of business. Because the environment is gonna do you in a lot quicker than most, most anything else. Reggie, a former U.S. Air Force survival instructor, showed us how to take a simple plastic sheet you can buy almost anywhere, a piece of sturdy string, and in no time, you've got shelter. What's great about plastic is very forgiving. Even if it's not perfect, it's still gonna work for you. And this time of year, the forest floor gives you all the stuffing you need to make a comfy mattress. CBN videographer Rachel Hooley and I we're determined not only to make our own shelter, but to sleep in it. Hey, it's working. Hey. I'm very excited about our mattress tonight. Look at this. This is, this is gonna be better than a hotel. Well, we are here snug as a bug in our tent. Here's Rachel. Hello. How, are you, how does it feel? It's cozier than I thought it would be. It rained during the night, but our shelter kept us warm and dry. 
Another vital part of survival, especially in winter, is fire. Fire serves a number of purposes other than simply keeping you warm. It allows you to cook, boil water for drinking, keep bugs and predators away, acts as a signaling device, and supports the number one survival skill, keeping a positive mental attitude. But what would happen if I threw that right on my tender? What would I be doing to tender? I'd smother it. So you see, this is where the platform and brace comes in. You put the brace next to your platform like this, right next to the tender. Then you take your first kindling, bunch it up nice and tight, and you set that right over top of the fire. If you see any smoke, it's saying, Reggie, I need oxygen. And all you have to do is just lift the brace up. I chose the flint and steel method to make my fire. I used a cotton ball smothered in petroleum jelly as my tinder. <laughs> Vaseline, hand sanitizer, even chapstick makes a cheap and easy accelerant in an emergency situation. So if you come out into the woods and you don't have an accelerant to start your fire, you can simply take a very sharp knife and scrape it and create what's called like a fluff, which makes excellent tinder. Fellow survival classmate Sage was successful using just fluff from the wood and a fire starter to get her blaze going. Now for one of the most important elements of survival, water. The average person can only survive about three days without water. You can survive three weeks or more without food. Your body is about 75 to 80 percent water. So you are going to get dehydrated really quick if you don't keep sip sipping that water. Remember what we say here at our school, ration your sweat, not your water. If you're in a situation where you don't have water purification tablets and cannot boil the water, try to find the entry place where the spring is coming out of the mountain, like this one. The water's coming out of the ground right there. See it? So it's being filtered through this ridge, hits this area and comes out right there. This provides your best chance of drinking the water before it's contaminated by animals and other bacteria. And last on the list, but not least for most of us, is food. Reggie showed us how to make a squirrel trap with a simple piece of wire. And I'm just going to funnel him right into my snare. This time of year, edible plants are scarce. Fortunately, the forest provides plenty of edible bugs. The best way to eat any insect is to cook it. Worms, grubs, termites, crickets, and beetles are your best bet. Although today, we went for what we could find, the popular wood roach. Oh, look at this. It's a buffet. See, I told you when you find one, you usually find a huge family. So in a survival situation, if we were really hungry, this wood roach would be an excellent source of what? Of uh, the fats, the carbohydrates that you need in a survival situation. Okay. Which you're not gonna get from plants. So I'm not saying don't go after plants, but these are readily available. They're all over the world. If you use those rules that I taught you, this is what you need. Okay, so we're gonna roast them. Uh -huh. all okay, right. so we just roast them, because they could have a parasite on there. So oh, get them down there yeah. in the flames. Getting nice and cooked. Okay, I can't believe I'm doing this, but in a survival situation, this little roach would be a great source of fat and carbohydrates. Tastes like a nut. Yeah, like a new. It tastes like a really tasty nut. Yeah. Wow, so you, very you, nutty. So you've just got over those food aversions, <laughs> and now you're going to survive. Reggie, <laughs> All thank right, you. You're welcome. Wendy Griffith, CBN News. We're heading to Studio 5 and hearing the story behind this popular worship song, Good, Good Father. Stay with us. The lead member of the band House Fires is in Studio 5 talking about the band's journey and their hit song, Good, Good Father. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. When did you come to music or music come to you? What happened? Ooh, I like the way you said that. <laughs> so my dad's a pastor in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So I grew up around the church and music. And so faith, music, all of it was kind of the same. I started, we had like a garage band in my neighborhood. <laughs> and 
It was just a way to have fun with friends. Music was this vehicle of connection and communion and expression with God that really started to set me free. I remember this young evangelist from the UK came to my dad's church and I was I was playing in the youth praise band at the time and it's, it's a really small non-denominational church and afterwards he came up to me and he looked at me and he said this message was for you. Wow. And I was like whatever right <laughs> yeah oh you're bold you, you would think it, you think it would be like oh but it wasn't it was just kind of like yeah and he, he says no you are going to write songs and at the time i had not sung he says you're going to use your voice you're going to sing and you're going to lead people to worship house fires the name what's the meaning yeah. behind that um we just the place where normal, unguarded, real life happens is, is, a, is a home, right? And that's where you learn patience with your spouse and kindness to your kids. And, you know, that's like the real stuff. And so that's where, that's where it needs to burn the, the brightest, right? One of your more popular songs, Good, Good Father. Um, did you write that? I'm one of the writers, mm -hmm. yeah. As I would listen and all these things, it, you start to notice slightly different threads of like, if when you get down to it, this person says God is like this. And this other person will say God is like this. And this other person will say God is like this. So now, which isn't a big deal when you're young, but, but when I started having kids, <laughs> and I'm looking at my, uh -huh. my daughter, Harper Gray, and I'm like, oh, how am I gonna explain God to you? How am I gonna introduce you to someone who's so transformed my life, what am I going to tell you he's like? Because you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. As we worship to that song, in our own community, like we were being healed from things we didn't even know we needed to be healed from, right? Wow. We're like all just experiencing a, um, like a, just a recalibrating of our hearts. Like, to see that same thing connect with so many people has been so like, so humbling, so mind blowing, surprising. We're just, but also so encouraging that 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 message is something we can stand on. You are here on the campus of Regent University, so obviously your music resonates with college students. Uh, why do you think that is? There seems to be a, a pull and a lean towards things that don't, that aren't presented as perfect and polished. And to have worship sound like worship and expression and music carry that texture I think that's the reason why it resonates with me you know I want my kids to when they when we talk about worship I don't want the first image that they have to be Sunday big stage lights fog cameras action you know what I mean like right. the first thought I want when we talk about worship is just my real life before God Worship filled the National Mall this weekend. Paul Strand takes us to The Call. Think how much a father loves it when his children just stop to love him and praise him. Now imagine God the Father with thousands of his children gathered on the National Mall in 57 tents just for the purpose of loving and worshiping him. Yeah. 
and it's all about King Jesus, okay? We are lifting his name up. It says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. We want to see the third great awakening. Every state in the union here is represented by Holy Ghost, Christian people of, of all races and colors that's here to worship the King of Kings. And all of those states and regions with their own tents were lifting up praise and adoration 24 hours a day, all weekend long. Nothing like this endless stream of worship from Capitol Hill all the way down to the Washington Monument has ever happened in the center of the nation's capital. Kent Henry's been a worship leader and Christian recording artist since the 1970s. I hope a lot of churches c catch a, a draft off of this, bro, because if, if every day believers start praying 20 minutes a day, I mean, with, including with some worship in it, things will start changing in America. It's coming back to the King of Kings, coming back to the God of America, coming back to the Statue of Liberty. And it's not that thing in New York City. It's the cross. It's the cross that set us free. That's our Statue of Liberty. Not just worship, but but preaching and prayer also filled the air. In order to carry compassion to a lost and dying world, we need to be filled with the passion of Christ. Heidi Baker of Iris Global was on hand all the way from Mozambique, where she's helped establish thousands of churches. She had an overflow crowd falling to their knees and crying out to God. On the main stage, Mark Gonzalez of the Hispanic Action Network led powerful prayer against racial and political division. Father, not only that, we're no longer going to get caught up in power to the people. We're coming in power to Almighty God over the nation of America. Because I believe prayer changes history. Nations were founded. Israel was founded in 1948 through prayer. The people crying out for a land and they got a land, amen? Okay, we're, we're pretty far down the stream morality-wise and ethics, but now we got a shot, especially with the change of the presidency, to do something great for Jesus. So hungry people still get filled. We need to see the fire of the Lord come again. Okay. True, the purpose of Awaken the Dawn was just to love on the Lord and worship Him. But believers here have a feeling that God's not going to let it in there, that He's going to show some love to the nation that showed it to Him. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the National Mall. And we leave you with this thought for a Monday. When God's grace meets your grind, great things happen. Thanks for watching. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Make it a marvelous Monday and a wonderful week. Goodbye and God bless.